actually um, on the. I know. I just start with that question. How let's start that? with that question. Yeah, let's start with that question. Okay, so let me read out the question in case people are confused, or they were looking at the the, the, the middle section on like Little Wayne or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking at Turbo Mac, and Turbo Mac is asking, how much noise does advisor add to the system? I can see the benefit. I don't want to overwhelm the already busy groups. Fair question, fair question. Well, we, uh, we actually look at noise, the issue of noise, uh, very, very intensely with advisor. Um, so there's one report that we look at every other day. It's called the um, Alert Effectiveness uh, Report, where we actually look at um, the percentage of alerts that um, hits all of the system across the entire advisor agent population. Um, and we look at the, uh, the fix rates, and we look at the ignore rates, and um, if there are alerts that hit a lot of machines, and there's not a whole lot of fix rates, or there's pretty high ignore rates, those are the type of stuff that we pull pretty quickly. We pull pretty, pretty quickly. And um, we also run our rules internally in um, silence mode as well, just to see uh, uh, how heavy they hit. Um, against the uh, the managed uh, environments, and uh, for those that you know uh, hits like more than ninety percent of the system, uh, we roll up our sleeves to investigate uh, to see what's up with that. Okay, um, so very recently we were dealing with some uh, uh, more security oriented, you know, security control related uh, uh, rule set that we want to roll out for uh, Windows Server. Uh, we're not looking for security uh, incident per se. We're just looking for security related stuff like you know firewall setting and all that stuff. And um, so we work with this uh, this team that actually manage uh, those rules, and uh, 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 kind of like brought up the noise issue to them. And we never roll out the, the the rules yet. So we actually went through all the analytics to uh, see what's going on there. And um, as part of that exercise, we have reduced the rule count from 95 to down to 29, just to cut out the noise. And we are very willing and very motivated to cut out crap from the system. And we'll do it before it hits you, okay? So um, I can't guarantee there'll be no noise, but um, it's a very high priority uh, on, on our side to make sure that uh, uh, that doesn't happen in the first place. Hope that answered the question, Turbo Mac. Thanks, Joe. So let's get started then. So yeah, thanks for coming. I appreciate you coming out this morning. As Joe talked about this morning, part of what we want to do at MMS is have that open dialogue with you, your customer, with, with our customers, and really kind of get, answer, get answers to your, we want to answer your questions related to operations managers. So we decided to put this session together. So you could come and meet all of the engineering team here from OM. Uh, we can have a discussion about some of the things that we hear, the questions, uh, and really just open it up so you can ask us, and then the other people can get the benefit from the, 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 the questions you're asking. So let's just start with some kind of welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, for those who uh, made the overview, thanks for coming to that and following it on here. Uh, I'm Daniel Savage, as Joe talked about uh, in uh, the overview. <laughs> I own the management packs, so I'm a lead PM. Uh, operations manager, been on the team five years, seven years at Microsoft. I used to work in Microsoft IT, uh, where I implemented operations manager and ran it uh, for, for monitoring line of business applications before I joined the product team. Uh, I have three of my steam PMs up here who can take the time to introduce themselves. Anna? Uh, my name is Anna Timasheva. I'm a program manager on global service monitor team. I've been at Microsoft for a long time, 16 years. And uh, I've been on uh, in System Center team for two years. Daniele Muschetta, I'm also program manager in the operations manager team. I own a lot of things related to application performance monitoring. And I was in Premier Field Engineering, so in the support organization for seven years back in Europe. And the last couple of years, I relocated to Redmond and I work in the product team on the same product. Thank you, Mr. Muschetta. And spam Daniel, remember to do that. <laughs> and give out his uh, email address for no reason. Yeah. I love to see it. Just make <laughs> him cry. 
my name is Joseph, uh, for those who didn't come from the uh, overview session, and um, uh, um, I'm an old-time friend of Daniel. Uh, we have started out in the ops manager team around the same time. Um, I'm also a lead program manager on, on, the, on the product team and uh, with the product group for around, you know, a little bit more than six years. Uh, before that, I was a developer on the Exchange server team. Thanks, Joe. So we also have some other members of our team here. Down at the front, we have uh, uh, Brian Wren, uh, who's, you know, MP author guy. Uh, we have people from our Dev and Test organization as well, Ruhi Eugene Marson. Uh, I see actually me and Joe's esteemed leader over there, Jeremy Winter, GPM operations manager. I see Vlad in the back, and I see a handful of our MVPs as well. So there's a, there's a lot of knowledge in the room. Actually, Doug, another one of our testers, is hiding here. Um, a lot of knowledge in the room, so we can, we can have a dialogue, get questions, answers to your questions, um, and make this session really useful. So I'm just going to throw out this slide. This slide has no reason whatsoever, apart from maybe just to kind of seed some thoughts into maybe what you want to ask some questions about. Um, we did talk about in the home session, in the session before, we did have some internet issues. Uh, some of the demos we couldn't quite do in full fidelity. If the, the internet seems to be behaving now, we can co recover those demos as well, uh, kind of later on in the session. So I'll open it up. The mics are available. Um, let's start, see if we can get a question going. If not, I have a question ready for Joe that I know he wants me to ask him. So. Questions? questions yes, right? great. Okay. That's a, that's a great question. So I'll just repeat the question. Uh, the question is around authoring tools. Particularly, we have Service Manager, Operations Manager, and Credence Synergy around the authoring tools we have there. Um, I think that's a great question. But authoring, like management packs, is an area that I own. And to give you some context, the way, the way I think about authoring is there's really three areas. And I'm, I'm going to talk specifically from an OM perspective, and then we can, I'll talk a little bit about Service Manager afterwards. There's, a, there's three main I think, personas that do authoring from an OM perspective. There's those that are kind of tweaking, updating, landing retail management packs in their environment and have to make adjustments to make sure it works effectively in their environment. And that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is really the, the developer, the ISV, who are really writing some uh, pretty complex management packs or running dashboards or running UI. Um, and, and, and need to kind of provide a, a, a full fidelity development environment for it. Then there's a bit in the middle, which I think you're, you're alluding to, is that, that IT pro authoring that needs to happen. I need to create uh, monitoring for a line of business application, or I need to produce something like that. And we've typically had a, 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 a sprinkling of tools in that area, I would say. We, we, we've, we've had our R2 authoring console. Um, we, we've had partners fill in that space. We, we've been We've been experimenting, I think, I, I think is the best word, with this Visio tool, which is really kind of thinking about how we can author management packs on based on a set of patterns. Um, so I think, as, as, as I look at this area, I think we do, we have the two sides, the, the, the tweaking side covered from a console perspective. We have a full fidelity development environment in the Visual Studio authoring console, which we'll continue to invest in. And I think we need to take the feedback and listen to you, listen, understand what we're doing with Visio to go and really solve that middle problem. I don't have an answer for you now, but you should know as part of ownership, we do want to go and solve that problem in that area. And the question then comes up, well, since OM and SM are similar, we need to think about, yes, we need to solve it for OM, but service managers become just as important, and I think we'll need to evolve in that area. So, so I hope that, just, just know that we do recognize and we need to go and invest there, okay? Next question. Yes, I'll take this and I'll come back there. Uh, yeah, I have a, two questions relevant to APM and I'd like to ask them too. No, that's absolutely. Uh, one of them is, is there any plan to uh, expand the .NET uh, compatibility to uh, legacy .NET apps? Instead, because right now it's at minimum .4. Uh, my university has a lot of uh, .NET 2 and 3 apps. We do support .NET 2 and above. We don't support 1.x because .NET doesn't support it anymore. Okay, well, I'll have to talk to you about that. 
Yes. The other one is when we go to app diagnostics, this is just kind of an annoying thing. You launch app diagnostics, it says, oh, do you want to close this website? Is there any plan to fix that? We try to address it, so in the very, I can tell you in the very early beta, we had like three of those pop-ups, and we managed to reduce it to one. It's an issue with the security zones and Internet Explorer, and we did not manage to work it around past that single step. Anyhow, what we really would like people to leverage, also, I, I did demo that before, but we'll show that more tomorrow in the other session on APM and Team Foundation Server Integration, is really, if your development team is there, to forward the, the information through the, the, the TFS connector. So have a work item open directly in TFS. And even you can have the IntelliTrace file attached to it directly without even having to go to the console. There's a question here, and then I'll come to every. It was uh, related to the previous uh, session. Mm -hmm. where you said that you were going to have more focus on the whole infrastructure and the, the workloads. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So to, to repeat the question, the, we talked about managing the whole infrastructure and workloads in the last session. And the question is, is will that expand beyond what we do with Microsoft to other such Unix, Linux, HP, UX, I think you mentioned earlier. Um, as, I mean, as we talked about, I mean, Unix and Linux is first class in operations manager as a monitoring the OS level. Um, the question comes in into the workloads that run on there. and. Operations manager, as we talked about, is a knowledge-based system. We provide knowledge through management packs to manage the workloads. We in Microsoft, because we produce the workloads, have the knowledge to push the management packs and give them out there for operations manager. Workloads that run in Unix and Linux, I mean, we, are, we don't have that knowledge. We're not the best people to say, okay, what is the knowledge associated with monitoring Oracle and Linux, for example? So that is really where our partner ecosystem comes into play on how we would um, provide the monitoring for workloads running across HP and Unix. And it's fully supported. There's a lot of partners as part of the System Center Alliance that do fill that gap. But we treat the fabric as first class. I mean, we know that data centers are heterogeneous in nature, and we have to support that. We're not just about kind of the, the Microsoft stack there. And you see that in investments in APM as well. We support J, J2E monitoring from an infrastructure level. I'm sure we'll have to make more investments there. So. Um, So I do know that our cross-platform team who develop like the, the Unix and Linux monitoring, they will work and drive with the partners based on the customer requests they see. They see. So Michael Kelly, if you don't know him, uh, he's the, one of the lead PMs who works on the cross-platform side. I'm sure he's driving with the partners where he sees gaps and needs for, for those particular areas. OK, thank you. There's a question over here. OK, good. Answered. Yes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the two, two questions there. Layer update connector, updating for 2012, and the second is updating custom fields through rules that you can't do it through monitors. Do you know? So, yeah, I can take the alert update connector question. Is, uh, is released for 2012 and uh, supported. So, um, that's the question, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brian, you have something to add? No, no, sorry, I was just asking Brian on the second one. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought you were questioning that. No. <laughs> because I'm pretty sure. I released it, man. <laughs> Unless someone pull it from the web. <laughs> Daniel asked me if I knew the second answer. I see. I was saying no, I don't. I see. So I got, I got you covered yeah. for the first question. Let's take the second one offline. 
Um, uh, you can come and come and find us after. Okay, Marnix. Yep. Okay, that's a great question. So let's 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 pause on that. Do, is it, are we working? No, we're. Let's come back to that. Yeah. So and we we, we uh, so the first point is on Azure monitoring. Uh, we, we're we seem to be lagging behind in Azure as the platform is moving forward. Um, we we as we announced in the home session, we just released the. We will be just releasing Thursday. It will go live. Uh, the update to the Azure management pack, which includes a, a brand new set of capabilities to really cover the investments that Azure are making that what we feel are appropriate for monitoring, particularly from an enterprise perspective. So uh, monitoring for virtual machines, monitoring for storage, continuing the investments on uh, cloud services. Um, we're also doing some pretty cool things on being able to kind of stitch together what's deployed. It's also multi-subscription as well. So you can set up, monitor multiple subscriptions, and we'll be able to actually create topologies of what's monitored. Um, if we did have a demo of this this morning, but unfortunately with the internet problems, we can't show that. If it comes back up, we will try and show you it today. But so there's a, there's a whole set of capabilities we're adding that we released on Friday. Totally get you, we have been lagging behind. We're now, kind of, I think we're caught up from an enterprise perspective, um, and we will continue to kind of go with this. The new Azure MP will come with a new guide that will explain everything on how to do that. And it'll be blogged on Thursday. Look out for the blog on Thursday, which will which release it. They have a session on Thursday covering it as well. Marcin's just reminding me. So there's, Man, a, there's a whole session. Connectivity is down, but I put up a slide with a new, one of the new dashboards for the new Azure MP that shows also a relationship between hosted services talking to each other. And there are new scenarios such as, you know, as you said, storage monitoring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if the network works, uh, I would show you live. This is a screenshot from the, the same environment I would like to use. So they're going to work on a, maybe a hot spot here, and we can get something set up. So um, question at the bottom. What's your name, sir? Pat. 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 P. Pat. P. Pat. I'm going to take this question. Sorry. Uh, Joe. This is regarding uh, uh, APM capabilities. Mm. Um, most, of, uh, most of the apps nowadays are access to a browser. So what is Microsoft doing to um, address that part of the end-to-end -end response time user experience? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good question. So to, to summarize, the question is about APM and the fact that most applications are accessed via the browser. And what are we doing to provide the monitoring and the experience, for monitoring for the experience in the browser, both natively and through VDI? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just cover it briefly and I'll pass it over to Daniele. So we do have, are you aware of the client-side monitoring capabilities we have as part of APM? So client-side monitoring is the ability to get to inject, as, the, as we serve the application, you can inject, inject JavaScript in there, which will measure the response time and capture any AJAX-based exceptions. So we do have that natively built in in APM now, so you can do that client side, which will work wherever you access the browser. Okay, so you, there is those metrics to add. Daniele, do you want to comment on the second part there? Yes, no, I, I think you covered the client side monitoring is what we have today. We definitely need to, um, in, increase maybe the coverage of the amount of browsers we support with that, but the capability is um, is provided to that to that piece. I'm not sure if you. Is, is it only supported in IE or? Currently, it is only supported in IE, so that's the limit we see. But uh, it does provide the capability of in, instrumenting the browser and showing you whether the slowness comes from 
render in the page in the browser or on the network or on the server, and it ties it together with the APM events on the server side when you have those. Okay, thanks. Uh, Take a question apparently we go and I'll come back to you. Say again, can you, I, I didn't hear the first part of that. Can you explain to So the question is Unix and Linux. Um, are you talking about when our management servers aren't able to communicate? And okay. Sure, sure. Um, that, do you know the answer on the agent side? Unix and Linux and the monitoring continuing when they can't communicate with their management server. Do you know what we do agent side? The Linux agent is essentially a daemon yeah. that sits there waiting to be interrogated, is not doing active monitoring and sending data so, out like the Windows agent is. I'm not aware of... Uh, so I it, the answer depends on the data source. Uh, so um, if the data source actually is something like a, like a, a type of log, for example, right, uh, then um, I believe the, uh, uh, the agent, or rather I should say that the agent in the combination of the uh, WS man server would keep track of the watermark. And so when the connectivity resumes, they will pick it up where they left it off. But um, if it is uh, something like an open Pegasus you know, type of value, right, that changes over time, right? When the connectivity resumes, it will pick up whatever the, the, the property is at at that time, you know, the property value. So, so, so um, So there is forward progress there, actually. Michael Kelly. Um, the no, but, but, but what do you mean by full blown agent? That's a priority to you? Okay. So I, I, I think Michael Kelly is the, the Unix and Linux guy. Take it over them. I know they are making agent changes there or how they communicate with the agent. So I, I would bring, that, bring up that conversation with him. Okay. So let's, let's I'm going to go, there's a question here, and then we're going to cover the Azure demo, and then I'll get these two questions. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. So we have Visual Studio authoring extensions. There's a session on this on, on Thursday. Marcin here is actually the, the developer who works and produces that, that set of capabilities. We will continue to invest there, uh, add in support for obviously the new IDEs, as they, well, the new Visual Studio IDEs as it comes out. But that's a full fidelity development experience with an IntelliSense building the Visual Studio so you can manage your whole life cycle. We absolutely need to keep investing there because it's how we support our internal product groups right in MPs. So that, that's what we'll be doing. Okay. Yes. So our file services management pack does do that, right? The, the, the file services management pack for Windows Server 2012, I think, supports discovery of SMS, SMIS already. Okay. So you're pulling in all the rain groups and all that information? I believe so, yeah. If you check out the file services MP and, uh, and see if it's there, if it's missing anything, please, I say, dsavage at microsoft.com so I get more spam. I'll, I'll, I'll get it. So let's, let's cover the Azure stuff, and then I'll come to the questions over here. And by the way, I don't call it spam. I mean, it's absolutely useful feedback, and I want, I want to get it. So, guys, Azure, ready? Vlad seems to be connected. 
And um, so <clears throat> I was moving around. Uh, some people might have seen it while uh, uh, you were talking. So this is the new topology dashboard that shows also the relationship between hosted services and either external resources or in some cases between different cloud services talking to each other. In, it's not the case in this one, but whenever they are talking to each other, uh, the system understands that uh, it will stitch those two objects together, for example. We have an answer. Um, so we discover storage. And I was pulling, so there will be some more dashboards in relation to storage and capacity. They aren't quite uh, functional yet, but I was showing you some of the performance counters here, um, such as um, the, the size of the storage account. And there is also a monitor on it that you can set. So you can set your threshold, and that basically uh, uh, becomes your metering for am I going above what I want to pay. <laughs> that, we don't, we don't do it in dollars, we do it in megabytes, but you, of course, can, can set the threshold to the appropriate value for how, how much you want to pay because the pricing is, uh, is understood. And, and the same way, we have uh, uh, interesting uh, aggregation rules. So for example, I'm looking at a, um, this is a performance view I pulled from the role object, and the role has these um, aggregated counters, such as the number of instances over time, so you can see when you've been scaling up or down the, the instance count. And here it's not configured, but you can also place those objects in a distributed application, and then we'll start collecting, um, or depending if you have the counters uh, enabled, you will start collecting those aggregates for uh, like CPU across all my role instances, again, an average per role, or, or, or memory in the same way. Um, these are all announcements we are doing. Um, so if you, I mean, if you look at what, we're, what, what I talked about, Marnix, back to your question, so can you go to the yeah, monitoring? So, so, so we now have the ability to configure multi-subscriptions. So if you think about like, the scenario we had in the past, it was really like a one-type subscription thing. But you as uh, IT Pro is running, you're going to be providing, if you are using Azure, multiple customers, you know, looking at the fabric. So the ability to support multiple subscriptions in there. We bring everything in. If you go to the monitoring pane, Daniele. Yeah, yeah. and in the monitoring. So in the monitoring pane, uh, you'll see that we, 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 we discover everything that you, you have within there first. So we don't actually monitor it by default. We just tell you what's there. So then you can then go and configure monitoring for the things that you care about. So we have a wizard in the authoring pane. Yeah that allows you to run through and say, now these are my Azure resources I want to actually add monitoring to. So once we give you, vis we give you visibility and says, apology, what's there, multi-subscription, then we actually can allow you to go and configure and set your monitoring there. So that's covering um, cloud services, virtual machines, and, and storage. And then what Daniel was showing you, which is the really cool thing, is we, we go and look at what's deployed, and because Azure has a model associated with it, we can tell who's talking to what. So it allows us to automatically discover how your Azure applications are working and create that topology dashboard that really creates a visualization of who's dependent on who, out of the box, with no configuration. So, so I we're kind of making strides there that kind of help. There was a question over here from earlier. So, yeah. How many system center advisor connectors can I have? Sorry, can you repeat the question? How many system center advisor connectors can I have? As many as you want. Uh, you only need one connector per management group. <laughs> you like to have more connector per management group? Okay. And we'd like to bring those connectors into our scum. Hmm. Hmm. So today, is, let me repeat the question. Uh, what is the question? <laughs> the question is that it seems like you are a managed service provider and uh, you would like to, in general, extend advisor capability to your customer. And so your environment is effectively kind of multi-tenant. Yes. And uh, you're asking for what is the recommended deployment option leveraging the connector in that case. Give me a minute to think. <laughs> Come back to that one. Question here, and I get that one at the back.
So, so the question is for, for APM and for Java monitoring specifically. So uh, I think I mentioned earlier, we have J2E support, um, really at the enterprise layer, and you can do some custom there. I think from a, an investment per st standpoint, and we, we, we talked about supporting platforms and heterogeneous environments, I think we need to make strides in the Java APM space and make it more like .NET. Um, I can only say we, we recognize a priority, how and when that comes, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure. But I certainly think we, 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 do, we do want to do more there. Okay, I'll take a question back. So the, the announcement that we sold it off Media Room to, I can't remember who we sold it to. But yeah. So the Media Room Management Pack, that's a great question. I don't know if I've, I haven't had time to think about it, but I can take an action item to find out whether that goes with them and they'll continue to invest from that perspective. So I'm presuming if they have, yeah, I, I, I can't give you a specific answer, but email me and I, I'll take an action to let you know. So, so getting back to the question of the gentleman okay. about the, uh, the multi-tenant, thing. Um, we got work to do on that case. It's basically the answer. Uh, but um, thank you for letting us know about your requirement and um, it's something that we'll consider. So today I can have one connection. Yeah. One connector. Per management. Per management group to, a, to an account. So the intended usage is that your management group connects to your one advisor account and brings the data back to you. In your case, as far as I understand, you're having all these separate customers. Each one of them has his own advisor account, and you would like to see their alerts in a single place. Yeah. That Anyone else have that scenario? John Joyner, you it's coming. Oh, yes, that we can do. Yeah. As long as you're willing. So you offer the account and they point the gateways at you. Yeah. So you, you can definitely, so the way I mean, imagine is you have all these sites out there connecting through gateway probably into your central management group. Um, when you deploy the, the connector, basically your management server tier in your central management group basically acts as proxy to talk to advisor. And so all those agents out there basically will talk to their gateway for the data to the, uh, the management server, the management server pipe up to that one central account. But if you want to basically say, well, I've got five customers out there, I want to open up five accounts, and as the alerts come, as the config data comes in, I want to like allocate them to the right account that way, that is something that we, we don't support yet. Mm -hmm. Now it's free. Right. As long as you work it out between you and your customer, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So more a more multi-tenant approach to, is that if, if I mean, if I summarize the capabilities for API, I mean, we do see that applications are typically driven out of departments or things and monitoring for applications typically needs to support that in a, in a multi-tenant way. Would that be fair? Okay. Yeah, so the, the, so the second part you hit on there, we, I mean, that's the, the role-based access across tasks, views, everything, all is ready there if you're looking at one estate. And when you get into different tenants, we have a different set of things there. And we, we've heard that feedback. If you look at where we're going with private cloud, I mean, just all up from a system center perspective, it's about the ability to go and support tenants to go on there. So monitoring needs to follow along with that. So we certainly recognize that as part of the investments we need to make to bring world-class public uh, private clouds. So, yes, and then I'll come over. Question about connection 
Mm-hmm. That's a good question. So the, the, the question to iterate is that a lot of the system, other systems in a project, are presuming through the new SPF as, as a REST API. Uh, and the way to talk to operations manager for connectors is through our, S, through our SDK. Yeah, I mean, I think as part of like, the previous point on private cloud, okay, and us becoming more system center integrated, I think there is a natural progression to get towards that as well. How and when, I don't know. But I'd say it's definitely something that we need to think about. Okay. I don't have anything to say, yes, it's coming and it's going to be here then. Okay. There's a question, There's a question at the back and then I'll come to you. Joe. Joe gets all the hard ones. Um, we get that feedback a lot. Uh, we're prioritizing. <laughs> I believe there is a partner who has something. That there is a partner, MIB to MP, right? Yes. Yeah, MIB to MIB to MP. There is a partner that uh, that uh, do provide that uh, uh, capability. Um, you know and. They, they charge for that. Uh, but in terms of uh, us rolling out a, uh, some kind of resource kit of sort to, to do that or build it and integrate it, um, uh, that is something that we are, we're, 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 we're discussing internally. Um, so we're, we're, we're having debates, <laughs> too. Um, but I'm on your side, just so you know. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, as part, as part of what I talked about on consistency and raising the bar, we are working with the orchestrator team to address these things. Uh, if you know, actually talking about pestering people, if you do, who knows Justin Incarnado? Used to be our community lead for operations manager, now works an orchestrator and owns the orchestrator management pack. So I'm working directly with him to ensure that we're doing the best job there. So fair feedback. Uh, if you have specifics, on details of what you think is missing, feel free to email me and I can let you know whether we're covering it or not covering it and what we're doing there. There was a question here, and then I'll come to you, Martin. Yep. Good question. So there's one person we didn't introduce when he came in, Mr. Satchavel, over here, is, is our UI and dashboards PM. Satcha, do you want to come up and answer this question? Give Satcha a round of applause for taking a hard question. Our dev lead for UI is here as yeah, well. Yeah, dev lead so. is here as well. You should hear this from the horse's mouth. So I, I give requirements, Eugene is the one that develops it. So. <laughs> Can you repeat, repeat the question? I didn't hear what he said. So the, so, I don't know why I need two mics. The, the, the question was that the, around dashboards and widgets, particularly dashboard performance, and then some of the widgets were missing functionality, I think is the summary of the question. So, so I know there's uh, Daniele Garandi had, pro, uh, had some blog posts on the performance. Uh, we are actually actively working on it right now. Uh, Ryan Benson, who's on Eugene's team, is uh, working on providing a fix for that, so that should be coming up uh, with the next uh, UR. So we have a concept of an update release, which we ship every two months, three months? Quarter. Every three months we have these update releases, so that fix is coming up in the next uh, next uh, update release. And that specifically is for performance? Yep, for the performance issue in, in the performance widget, I think is the specific comment. Um, one thing that you know Eugene and I have been hearing from a lot of you all is around uh, providing customization and extensibility on the dashboard infrastructure. And um, I know that's something that we haven't done a lot of previously, but we hear a lot of feedback on that, and that's actually something that we're focusing on over the next couple of months is to provide you guys samples, documentation, on how to extend and leverage the dashboards. Um, we're actually doing a session today at 4.30 um, where it's going to be our kind of first kickoff on the extensibility of this dashboard infrastructure. We'll talk about some of these performance issues and some of these uh, small bugs that you guys have reported and how we are trying to address them as well. So uh, 4.30, I 
at uh, South Seas F. F. Thank you, Sacha. Then, uh, okay, Marnix, I think you had a question. Network monitoring. Okay, good question. So Marnix's question around network monitoring, or as we said, the vast improvement over 2007. But we are limited by the number of devices we support and what is our plans to make sure we're supporting additional devices and so people get the extended monitoring and not just the basic monitoring. So in SP1, we've, we've, we've done an update which included an extended set of devices, correct? Oh, there was some question around network devices. Network device monitoring, yes. Martin's question is, what is our plan to ensure that we're adding additional devices? Oh, and you covered the uh, standard SP1. port monitoring, and those are really just extended monitoring capabilities. And, and even having said that, we're still adding a couple of hundred more devices to that list for SP1. But, like I said, those are for extended monitoring purposes. Any devices that support MIP1 and MIP2 uh, uh, interface, we would provide standard. Uh, port monitoring, and that means we can detect whether the device is up or down. We can um, let you know at the port and interface level what is the utilization uh, uh, rate, what is the latency, and so forth on there. And those are the P0 uh, scenario that we care about. Those. So the question is, um, uh, what is our story around extensibility uh, for uh, network uh, uh, monitoring uh, for devices where um, uh, expert like uh, Marnix out there who wants to add additional layer of richness uh, to a particular device? Uh, the answer is that we have SNMP extensibility support uh, around that. So uh, you can use that to author and uh, extend the device uh, um, as you wish. And so that's kind of like the path that we recommend. Okay. Question over here. Oh, come on. I think we do. I think Connect is still open. It does eventually flow through us and end up in our TFS database. Um, yeah. I mean, it does come through Connect, and you can use the voting up and down, and we get a, we get that lands in our TFS system on who voted for what and everything like that. Um, Uh, email him directly. Email, <laughs> email, me. email will be faster. It depends on the response you're looking for. Certainly, if if it's if you have a like a bug or a, like a, you're having a, an issue, I mean support is obviously you, you where, where you go there. If you're not getting traction, the statement Joe was making from an MP's perspective, then you can email me direct. So, okay. Mm-hmm. Support for CMDB federation, as in multiple service managers, or? <laughs> Spam him. That's a good question. I, I don't specifically know the answer. I'm looking to see if there's any of our community MVP guys who may have an answer to that question. If not, let's, let's take it offline. I'll get you in contact. So I know that some of the service manager PMs are here. We, 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 we can take it up with them. There was one here, and then I'll come over here. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. 
Okay, so the first question, TFS connector, we, so we have a set of resolution states, and the question is, is whether those resolution states could be changed because they could conflict with other processes. Just the names. Yeah. Yes, uh, there is no, it's not exposed in the UI because those resolution states are marked as protected, but there is an unsupported but no problematic hack that you can do to enable editing them and then protect it again. Uh, if you shoot me an email, I'll send you a link. Uh, it's a DB hack, but it's very simple and no, it doesn't create any. <laughs> It's just a very simple You're thing. You're on your own with that. Yeah. So. <laughs> but I think that, the, the, yes, you might. I don't, we're not going to recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> However, we will take the feedback and think about getting a supporting way to do that. Right. Sorry. That's a great question. So I think to summarize is like taking pattern-based authoring to the, allow the generation of MP code. Uh, yeah, and this is something we're talking about. We would, back to the authoring question earlier. As we renew, well, as we continue to strengthen our management pack investments, authoring has to happen alongside that, and we have to fill those gaps. So we'll take that, and we will think about what we can do there. And Marson sitting in front of you, I'm sure he's listening to that as we think about the plans going forward there. Okay. Who's question over here? Okay. So the question, I don't know if you heard it, Joe. Security from an advisor perspective mainly for government agencies and how do you give confidence to the security team that using advisor is okay for them to use? Uh, that, that's a good question. I mean, um, the whole cloud service um, uh, uh, dialogue is, uh, I mean, like happening across the entire industry. And so... Um, uh, we too are having, you know, obviously dialogue with, uh, you know, some uh, agency in, in the government uh, related to different services, uh, and you know, they basically different agencies have different requirements as well. Um, at, at the end of the day, uh, the 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 privacy statement is our primary vehicle of communication, okay, and that's really the the kind of like the our promise and the contract. Uh, to um, how we handle your data and how the data is forwarded and so forth. And specific, you know, security personnel within um, a particular agency would basically evaluate that and uh, make a cost and benefit decision, right? At the end of the day, it's all cost and benefit. Uh, 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 a cost of, you know, how much control, you know, uh, uh, they felt comfortable with, um, uh, you know, letting go a little bit and, you know, kind of like balance that with the benefit that they gain. And so um, um, it's a good question, but, you know, right now uh, it's really in a, in a um, uh, agency by agency dialogue uh, phase at this point. Do you, just to follow up, do you think you're going to get questions over, like, the, what we collect and what we do or more about just, like, how do we secure the channel? How do we secure the data at rest? Is, those, is that the type of information you're looking for or...? Hmm. Yeah, it's a fair point. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think from a, from a Microsoft standpoint, yes, you're right. I mean, we, we do secure our boundaries across all our services. Um, I mean, we know that we, we secure the data, we secure the data over the channel. We take whatever reasonable, we take the most reasonable methods to ensure that the data is there and the private statement covers what we do with it, what we don't with it. So, I mean, if there's specific kind of follow-up questions as you're getting into those conversations, I mean, we, 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 we should certainly yeah. help you answer that. The, the, the main point I've emphasized is that uh, from the collection point to the cloud, the channel is as secure as it gets. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, now the, the challenge obviously comes when the data land on the cloud side and because we need to do processing on that, right, and we do have very strong partitioning between uh, different tenants uh, in the cloud, but at the end of the day, you know, we definitely need access to that to, to add value to you, right? And so on that front, uh, it, it still comes down to the, 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 the trust issue, right? And so, um, which goes back to kind of like my prior point mm. on, um, you know, how that dialogues uh, un un unfold. Thanks, Jim. Next question. So we've got three over here and then I'll come down this side. Any of you go. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, the, the, so the, let me repeat the question. Uh, when, uh, let's say you have, I, I, I'm just making up the scenario, but I think if the scenario match, match what you're asking for. Say you have a thousand servers in your environment and you have you know, SharePoint admin, Link admin, SQL admin, and, and so forth. Um, right now, it seems like with the connector, there's only one view called advisor alerts. So what the heck, how, how am I going to like dole these like alerts out to the appropriate consumer of the alerts and let them use it appropriately? Um, so the answer to that is um, uh, you can leverage user role, okay? So uh, as you create uh, a, a user role within uh, uh, Ops Manager, uh, you can basically place those server in the appropriate groups, right? And so when they are, when a user that belongs to a particular user role uh, basically uh, connects to SCOM, uh, those advisor alert is already targeting the same class that um, the, 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 uh, the workload MP actually uses, okay? Yeah, so SharePoint server would basically, you know, the, the class from uh, uh, advisor would inherit from uh, uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the SharePoint class, for example. But at the end of the day, you would have, um, I, I mean, the bottom line is that you'll have server groups for those guys, right? And so what happens is when they sign on, they will, they will only see advisor alert related to their group. And so that will just work out of the box. Yeah, so basically the answer is user role will basically solve your, save your day. Okay. Red shirt. Do we have any plans, just to make sure I heard you correct, to do a first party app for active, accessing alerts on a mobile device? That's a good question. Um, I, th I think we need to take that feedback. I mean, I think we, I mean, we have to recognize the consumption of data is going to exist across multiple devices, and we need to solve for that yet. Yeah. I don't have anything fixed yeah. on when. when I, can, I can add a little bit to that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a really good question. It's a question that we are, we are also you know, talking very actively uh, among the engineering team. Uh, I mean, to bring that out to a larger topic, right? I think many of you have been saying for many years that there are way too many consoles in System Center already. And so now we're faced with a challenge of, you know, how do we consolidate uh, System Center uh, together and kind of like bring that forward in a timely fashion add new value at the same time, address new uh, devices. So as you can see, is, uh, is a huge engineering uh, 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 question uh, that hangs over our head right now, but we are um, uh, uh, very, very much, you know, actively talking about this topic. So just stay tuned. It's something that is not like we're casting aside and, you know, not looking at. Mm. It's something that we're, like, looking at and like, kind of like in an overdrive manner right now yeah. and trying to figure it out. So, uh, can you repeat that? Sorry. Uh, Read-only access to the authoring view in the console. Any plans to support that? Is that the question? Or? Okay, so they, they want to see the, the effective configuration, really, in a read-only manner, and they feel they need to do that through the, the authoring 
Is that a common ask in the room? I just want to get a quick answer. Okay. 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 There are there there are ways to do it. I mean, there's obviously we have reporting. There's some tools out there that can kind of list out what's configured. I know that the partners exist in this space for doing it, but we'll certainly take the feedback to think about how it could be a more integrated. So, so I just want to make the make sure the requirement is clear: is you you the, you want to allow the user to have read-only access in the authoring console, not even to set override, right? To see what's configured, to see what's being right. monitored. But they can't even apply override. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the effective configures. So have okay. you seen the power? We've got a PowerShell commandlet that does effective configuration when you target it at something, and it'll list out everything that's configured. Is that the kind of thing that they want to look at? Okay. Sure. Yeah, okay, makes sense. And the, the reason I was asking about the PowerShell is the output of the, the PowerShell that gets effective configuration, is that what you want to? Okay, okay. So drop us an email. We, we can kind of cover what's available now and we can kind of see if it meets your specific use case. But we'll obviously take the feedback from the, obviously the hands that came up in the room as well. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I think there's multiple ways to get at that information. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So just just to iterate what Ruhi is saying to me in the monitoring space, when you go to the Health Explorer, you do get the rule and the monitor details in there, which is obviously available read only to the read only operator role. But you can see the configuration. Okay. So I think this is, this is a great discussion. Maybe what we can actually do, since there's so much interest in here, I think us getting out what's available now and detailing that in some blog, and then we'll put Joe Chan's email address at the bottom so you can email him <laughs> for the... You guys don't have my email address. Yeah. yeah, so the person who emailed me actually just now, I will send you Joe Chan's email address. Feel free to distribute. So, okay. so just, a, just a quick question, though. Um, is there anyone who don't want their operator to see anything in the authoring space. Okay. That's John over there. I didn't recognize that. Hey, John. John doesn't want it. Can we expand that question, John? Is there the ability to set a role based on what they can see? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you say you want to limit somebody who sees specific information. They don't have access to it. Why do you see a guy in the DDP or their user base is? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so uh, let me refine the question then. <laughs> uh, is there anyone who is not okay for their operator to see a scope view of the authoring space with workflow monitors or rules that only relates to their workflow? Is not even okay with that? Still, John. <laughs> You're greatly outnumbered. I think I may have found my cheap solution. Yeah. Okay. There was some questions over here. Yes. I'll come to you. I have this question about offering kits. Okay. In a lot of the areas you're describing, you're describing some of the improvements and how you're going to get even better over time and how, you know, with authoring, we took something away from it. And six months later, I still can't author like I did before. You offer 45 in a year. I can't offer one the way I used to. Okay. You have no training. You have no actual definitive answer on how you're going to replace what you've taken from it. Mm -hmm. We have 150 custom-made things to be made through that offering console. I can't make one today. Okay. So you, when we say what we're taking away, do you mean the, the R2 authoring console? Yes. Okay. It's, I mean, we didn't take it away. I mean, it's still available. It's still there, there to be used. Um, as far as like, the, the trend documentation, Brian, do you want to kind of comment? I mean, Brian ran out here is the one who produces all our content from an MP thing. Um, yes, yeah. And Brian actually said in a session the other day, he said, if you can't find what you're doing for MP authoring, it is his fault. So, yeah. I knew I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, yeah we, so like Daniel said, the R2 authoring console still exists. We still support it. 
we're just not going to invest in it further. So it's still, remember, an art, anything created for 2007 works fine in 2012, right? And we, we usually, that's our best practice is we target the 2007 schema. Really the only thing is dashboards um, that you need for 2012 that's unique. As far as training content and the whole thing, and I've got slides, I've, I'm kind of invading a few different sessions this week and throwing up a slide or two about my stuff. Um, but we're moving, it, with, one of the ways that we're trying to do just to get more content out there faster and is to try to scale me a little bit, um, is trying to go a little more community based. So we've taken the entire authoring guide has now moved over to the TechNet Wiki, um, which allows and I'll invite anybody, I know there's some people in the room who do some great work and you know, please, I mean, give us some of your knowledge, add to that, modify my stuff, you know, what a, uh, you know, help us out in getting that built. Don't worry, we monitor it, we make sure to maintain the integrity of the content. Um, so we're, we're, I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to address. More samples, more content. I'm going to take, I got a request and I, another one that I kind of threw out that maybe I shouldn't have because now I am committed. Um, the full day training that we did, but three, four years ago, I'm sure some people were in there with like a marathon training on Monday for all MP authoring. I'm going to be updating that this summer for 2012, and I'm just going to basically record it and put it online. So, so we're going to have some of those out there. But anything that you're missing, like I said, BREN is my email, or uh, BWREN, or MP author, mail either of those, any stuff you can't find, please. Those, yeah. those are things I'm trying to prioritize yeah. on what we put out. And, and okay. just, just to, I'm not downplaying when I talked about us having to go and figure out that space for the IT Pro where we've had the author and console and Visio. That is a hot topic for us right now. I mean, we know that we have to like, ensure that we have best management packs and we have to ensure that we have a consistent authoring story. So it's hot for us now. We recognize that I, I, I feel your pain and I'm not, certainly not trying to downplay the, the investments we need to make there. So. That's a, that's a fair point. And I, I'm just to, to iterate the point, to, I'll iterate your statement and then I'm going to expand on it. The, the statement was there's a way to think about when you import MPs to be able to see what the MP could do and then choose what it's going to do as the MP is being imported and set the overrides and stuff like that. I think that's great feedback. I think there's, there's also, I think there's another set of scenarios around that, like kind of phased rollout, okay, kind of being able to say, okay, I only want to target this set of servers first to see how things go, and then I want to roll it out. I think there's scenarios that relate to that. I also think there's ways for us to actually provide best practices out of the box. One of the things that we want to do with our knowledge, and it's almost like, could we provide the management pack, but then provide a set of override management packs that have been tested and targeted in environments so that you don't need to do that checking of work. Here's, here's a, a set of overrides targeted where if you say you have a 50 servers compared to where you have 1,000 servers, or maybe an override management pack that turns everything off so you can run it in discovery. I think the point I'm trying to make is that I, I hear you on, the last thing we want to do is import a management pack and have a ton of noise and then have to go and spend some time to do that. And I think there's various ways that we can make that investment, but I, I'll, take this, I'll, I'll take the feedback from the, the UX perspective. So, make sense? So just to iterate, you're saying, is there a way to have everything turned off by default and then turn it on as 
I think, I think that's something we can think about, exploring, right? So, I mean, I think as we, we look at setting the bar for the managed impacts that are delivered, I think there's, there's multiple options we can go after there. So, I mean, what we'll probably do is we'll reach out more as we're kind of exploring this and get feedback on what we think works and what doesn't work. So, yeah, good feedback. Yeah, gentlemen on this side. Client-side set, yeah. So the question is GSM and will we support client-side authentication for, for the, the management of tests? I think Anna probably answered in the session yesterday that it's not currently supported. Um, I think to expand on that and Anna jump in, I don't think we will, yeah, I mean, I think the, 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 we need to think about how that's gonna play, whether we offer it via our public points of presence and what that would mean of putting them there or we provide a way to kind of provide it through an agent that you run and own yourself. So I think we, we've heard the feedback and we now need to prioritize where that investment lands. The second part of the question, does it exist? Currently I'm not aware of anything, an operations manager that does support the synthetic transactions for client sites. So. But the feedback's taken, absolutely. I've heard it several times. What are next? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Marnitz. So the, the Marnitz is just coming on and um, expanding on the comments here on, and I think this all comes down to noise. Right, noise and being overwhelmed by when things land in the um, environment, talking about the exchange management pack and the discovery helper and the ability to phase things out. Totally get it, I mean, we, this is part of what I'm trying to drive, I need to get this feedback and then I, we need to kind of work on how we kind of move things forward, so. Someone at the back? Yes. That's a good question. So to, to iterate the question is doing correlation and more importantly doing suppression where it's saying I maybe have generate an alert and turn off a set of monitoring based on a particular health condition in there. So yeah, I, I think that's good feedback. I think those are, those are the type of things that we need to go after from our improving our monitoring platform. So I don't have anything to say. Joe, do you want to add? So. Yeah, it, it, it's a problem that we, we, um, we're well aware of. Um, we are um, we're trying to evaluate some more creative approach uh, to do it. Um, probably in the future, more on a data tier than in the runtime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, that's probably the direction that we're we're going to be looking at more the data tier to see what we can do there. Yeah. Okay. Did I see? Yep. GSM. Yep. To reduce the frequency from five minutes? The question is GSM, is there any plans to offer a frequency less than five minutes for running tests? Um, so uh, we have a feature on our roadmap which we call private agents. This would be ability to instantiate your own watcher node, your own GSM watcher node. So once we move uh, in this direction we may allow faster frequency because it's your own agent and you bear the cost. But I think for public agents, at least in the near term, we are not considering it. 
Okay. The, 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 way, the way we think about it is, certainly for now, I mean, there's two aspects to it. One is um, a cost perspective. I mean, it literally comes down to the, the cost of us running this service and providing it to you as a software's assurance benefit is a price per test. Uh, so we, we've, we've hit it at the, the area to be able to offer it uh, you free of charge, which means that we offer a given set of capabilities. One of that is the minimum test frequency of five minutes. The other way, the, on the other side, is as you're monitoring applications, and I'm running them, say, from 10 points of presence, okay, and I'm running that every five minutes, you're actually going to be getting a test sample from each of those points of presence about every 20, 25 seconds. So given that GSM is about determining availability of your application, you're going to be getting data points that are, less, that are more frequent than every five minutes anyway. So that's part of what we're looking at. But I think as Anna's point, private agents, to give you more flexibility, is where we want to go. And that covers a lot of scenarios as well. And I think that's where we get into the, the client-side certificate and additional authentication mechanisms when we do support private agents. Good question. I think, I, OK, here. Yeah. So the first question is the notification channel, making, allowing you to do excludes without creating a group specifically for includes on the notification channel. So, so my question, actually, I, I'm not clear on the point on what is, uh, what is preventing you from creating a group in the first place? So basically, you have to create two groups, one which does your monitoring and one that controls your notification channel. Does your, does your group, so this is more of a group definition question. Uh, at least I'm, I'm trying to approach it that way, right? It, it, does it shift a lot in your environment where, you know, kind of like group definition changes, you know, uh, depending on the... Right, right. I understand that's the uh, that's the that's the workaround that you have to do, and, and that's painful if 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 your group definition has to change all the time, right? I mean, based on our understanding and research, is that typically these things are pretty stable. Uh, uh, but I'm just trying to get a survey in the room if if that's not the case. <laughs> It's all positive. It matches include, and it's never, if the alert string matches this, don't include it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, again, in unsupported ways, in, 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 no, no, I'm saying it's a matter of having UI for it. Technically, the, the, it, that's the workflow. The notification is a workflow with a condition, with a filter. So, yeah. it would be technical, it would be technically doable to build an expression. Uh, it's the UI that doesn't allow it today. That's, that's what I was yeah. trying to Yeah, so that's supported. To differentiate. Yeah. And the same thing applies to the other. Yeah, it's just hard to do. I understand. I understand. I'm saying that we, we have the capability in the workflow, not in the UI. Fair point. Okay. There was, there was one here. Yeah. Uh, I got a question about the health function. Uh-huh. Um, I have a
Okay, so to recap, you're monitoring something. Okay, two monitors configured that. Both should generate alerts when they change state, and you're seeing behavior where alerts aren't being fired. Oh, okay, so it's actually that we, we, we ship inconsistent behavior, is that what you're saying? That we have shipped some MPs with monitors that do generate and some that don't? And how do you understand which do and which don't? Is That's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think that gets into the head of the MP author at the time of when they did that, right? And I think that we need to drive consistency there. Part of what we're doing is we have a tool called MPBPA, which reflects over the management pack and says these are the things that you should or shouldn't be doing. And I believe that one of the rules does relate to the monitors and the states and everything we do there. Um, Reflecting on what was shipped in the past, I can't give you a good answer that would say why we have one over the other, but it's a consistency we need to drive forward. Okay. So I'm just going to, we are running right up against time. We'll take one more question. We're here all week. I'm not actually, but these guys are here all week. Um, so we'll take one more question and then we'll wrap it up. So is there a connector that will take an alert out and pack it to a ticketing system and include the knowledge associated with the alert? I don't sure. Vlad? We have implemented it in TFS integration, but it's we, so it's we own possible. both sides of the equation there. It's, no, it's Visual Studio and it's all Microsoft. Um, <laughs> Check the question. Pardon? How would you get that URL passed? So it's a standard URL with uh, the, one of the properties of the alert that you can create. Sure, sure. Well, let's, given the time, let's take it offline. We can talk about the scenarios. I want to thank you for coming. It was very important for us to have this dialogue with you today. As you say, we're here, uh, but we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.